I want to welcome you to the Trauma Informed Educators Network podcast. Uh, this podcast is coming out of the Trauma Informed Educators Network Facebook group. Um, I am so looking forward to talking to people globally about their trauma informed journey. As the principal of Fall Hamilton Elementary School, a trauma informed school in Nashville, Tennessee, I have learned that this is not a destination and it truly is a process of learning and, and adjusting. So this podcast will be speaking to guests all over the world about people who are just starting their journeys and people have been on this journey for many, many years. So I hope you enjoy our guests. I hope you learn something just as I am. And welcome to the Trauma Informed Educators Network podcast. I wasn't going to say anything tonight, but I am. Um, first of all, I'm very sad and angry that we're even having to talk about lobbyists because every single person that lives in Montgomery should be talking about this and talking about these kids. Now, I'm going to say some things and maybe I'll get fired from being on the board. I don't know, but I, I, I've got to say my piece about this. I wasn't alive when the Civil Rights Movement started, but my people were, and they made decisions then, and that's why we're sitting in this situation now. Come on now. now, let me just say this. I grew up in domestic violence, child abuse, alcohol, and everything. I'm not going to talk about me, but school was my safe place. And when I was in seventh grade, I made a commitment to God and to Christ that everything in me, I was going to commit to this city to help a child if it was in my power to do so. Unfortunately, the same people that look like me are the ones that are blocking this. They should be first in line to say, we want to support you and we want to support the black children in this community because that's what we're talking about. And when I ran for school board, I want you all to know as the first person that said that, that it's a race problem. I wasn't able to speak up in the 60s because I wasn't born and I was too young, but I'll be damned. I'm going to speak up for it now. It's going to make a lot of people mad. My day started this morning at 7.30 with a call from Montgomery Police. For those of you who don't know, I work at Child Protect. Because a six-year-old baby, kindergarten little girl, has been being raped over the last several months by a 51-year-old neighbor. That's how my day started. You know how it came out? Because her grades started dropping and she was having behavior problems. But we didn't have the counselors in place and we didn't have the teachers that knew how to respond to that except to make her go stand in the hall day after day. And you know what? She finally, because her mother wanted to know what was going on, so she told her. This had been going on for months. So she told her, and when she came to us today, she said, if I tell y'all, are you going to be mad? Am I going to be in trouble? Because we don't have the funding for that. Because the black and brown children are not important to people that look like me. They're not important. But they're important to me. And then we got another call at 1 o'clock. Ten-year-old boy fighting. Grades are bad. Fighting. Grades are bad. For a year because a 24-year-old cousin has been molesting him over a year. Now that's two children, and I know that's a small percent of the 29,000, but let me tell you something, our community and these children that we all ran, this is not about money. $100,000 or $500,000 we pay an attorney and we pay these lobbyists because we have to, because people that look like me are not stepping up. It's not about money, and we all know that. And I'll tell you this, every fight that's in me, I'm fighting for those kids because there are 29,000 kids out there, and the majority of them are black and brown, and they live in poverty, and they live in communities that are they witness horrific things and traumatic events every single day. And school is their refuge, and that is the only way that they're going to get out of that and the only way that they're going to better themselves. And it is up to us, and it is up to you, and it is up to every single person that lives in Montgomery County. 
and shame on them if they're not supporting it. I hope every one of them is listening tonight. And that's fine. You don't want to support me anymore. That's fine. I didn't run to be supported. I ran to help these children and everything in me. And I said I wasn't going to say anything tonight. But I'm going to tell you, the spirit is stronger than me. And I hope it's stronger than everybody in this community. So vote how you want to. But I'm voting for kids. And I'm y'all see me on the street corner. And I'm going to have my thing out there. So. Yeah. All right, Jana, how are you today? I am so excited to have you uh, as a guest on the Trauma Informed Educators Network podcast. It's, I know we've been kind of dodging each other trying to get this done, but how are you? How are you doing during this time? I know it's awkward. Um, how's it going? Um, um, it's going pretty good. We're empty nesters, so we're not having to, the challenge of doing homeschool and having kids there all day. So it's just me and my husband. Um, I think sometimes we wish there was some other distractions, but um, we've gotten a lot of yard work done and doing some projects inside and a lot of reading. So um, there's been a lot of blessings in it, I will tell you. Um, I said last week, I thought there was gonna be a run on soda crackers and everybody that knows me know that is like my addiction. And I thought we were out of them last week when I was having some soup and I found a whole box in the back of the pantry. So. You know, there are things that are going to be uncovered that are good and bad, I guess, during this. You know, I have a teacher at my school, and she has a saying that she is insanely optimistic. And I'm, I feel like that's the space I'm living in right now of, you know, we've got to focus on the good because it's easy to get mm -hmm. caught up in what's not going well or good. But um, right. so, so right. we're going to jump in here. I, I, I want to hear you. Right. I want to hear your story. So that's the first question I have. Tell, tell me about you. Tell me about where you are and what you do and all of that. All right, sure. Well, um, Jana Bailey, and I was born and raised in Montgomery and went to public schools. I, I'm 58, so I was born in 1961. If that tells you a little bit about the era that I was born in, I was in third grade when the schools were integrated here. Um, I grew up with um, domestic violence and child abuse. My father was an alcoholic and also did drugs. And so, um, you know, that, and I had a younger brother who was three years younger than I was. And, you know, school was really our safe place because, um, you know, we soaked in the learning and, and we saw what regular, you know, other, that this, what we were living in was not necessarily normal, but um, there were, you know, families that didn't do what our family did. Um, I was in seventh grade and, you know, had started recognizing that, that even that age that black and brown children were treated differently in our classrooms, you know, a lot of times made to sit at the back of the class or, you know, there were just a lot of indiscrepancies. And this, this particular year, my life, I was 12, um, was especially hard. My parents had divorced and remarried and then the, the remarriage really escalated a lot of things. So I decided then that I really wanted to go into some sort of service to help children. And I made that commitment then. Um, a lot happened through the years, obviously. I mean, you know as well as I do, you can't help others until you help yourself. And I don't think that realization came until I was 23 and had my first, or 25, I'm sorry. Can't remember how old I am anymore. but. Um, when I had my first child and I realized that I wanted to be the best mother that I possibly could be for him. So um, anyway, so speed through all of that. I, I've been at Child Protect now for 19 years and um, that was last week, my 19th anniversary. And um, we help investigate child abuse cases. So we see uh, about 300 children a year in Montgomery County. 65 to 70 percent of that is child sex abuse and the other 30 percent is severe physical abuse or if a child has witnessed some type of traumatic event whether it be you know domestic violence or a shooting or rape or drugs or whatever it is then we will provide the forensic interview and counseling and advocacy to those children so that's kind of in a nutshell, I guess. Yeah. So how you ended up on, on this podcast was I was watching, uh, I saw a YouTube video of you and your advocacy 
in raw, true bravery and Thank vulnerability. You. And I, I can tell you that it, it, it did more than resonate with me. It inspired me. It, it made me step back and think if I were in a space of, of opportunity, would I jump in as you did? So for those of you who haven't seen the YouTube video, I'll be linking it um, of Miss Bailey here, or Jana, I'm sorry, you told me to call you Jana. Yeah. Yes, Jana, Jana. <laughs> yeah, um, during her school board meeting. So you're a school board member in Montgomery mm -hmm. that advocated for kids of color, that you knew there were some um, discrepancies in the way they were being treated or provided opportunities. Can you tell, tell us about up to the point what you were advocating for and why you chose to advocate it when you did? Because it was amazing. Well, I'll tell you just briefly um, about the, the last couple of years in Montgomery, what has been going on. Um, this problem obviously has, has existed a long time, but over the last two or three years, our city and our chamber and businesses um, about three years ago got together and, and they we were at risk and still are at risk of losing Maxwell Air Force Base, which is huge economic impact on Montgomery, as you, as you know. Um, any school in the Air Force that's, that someone in the Air Force goes through is in Montgomery. So they, their statistics came out and said, look, about 52, 57% of the people in the Air Force that come through these schools are coming without their families because of the schools. So there was this big cry, we've got to change. The board at that time was dysfunctional. Um, not everyone on there was, but there were a few that were not really moving things ahead as it needed to be. So um, I got a phone call from a friend who said, hey, your name's at the top of our list to run for school board, will you do it? And I was like, what? I mean, I, my name is Bailey, maybe alphabetically that ended up at the top, <laughs> I don't know. But um, so, you know, after about five minutes of prayer and thought, I just felt like this was what I was supposed to do. So. I'm not a politician. I, you know, this is, you know, I love my job and, and this was not on my plan, but I felt like, you know, this was what I needed to do. So I ran and um, I ran against an incumbent and she had been there, I think 12 years and I won. And um, what my, what I spoke on throughout my campaign was we have got to say out loud that we have a race problem in Montgomery, Alabama, that we are treating our children differently, the children that are black and brown. And I said that throughout and, and calling that out, I mean, everybody knows it, but it's, it's saying it out loud. You know, no one wants to hear it out loud because then people think, oh, they're as backwards as they've always been. Um, so over this past year, I've only been on the school board a year and a couple of months, um, very new to the school board. And, but, you know, I didn't run to run again. I didn't run just to sit up there. I mean, I ran because someone saw in me or a group of people that, you know what, you need to be the voice. So, um, one of the problems that we have is we do not have enough funds in our school system. We have 10 meals of property tax, what our property tax is, and I'm not a mathematician, I don't understand, it's very complicated about all that. But we had eight until the early 2000s, and then the legislature said, you know, we've got to do better, so we're gonna increase it to 10. So we have 10 meals, which is the lowest you can have legally in, in our state. So we have been at that for a long time and you just, you know, you can't fix buildings, you can't have infrastructure, you can't add additional things like the arts, which is so important to children. Um, one of the other things that started kind of, you know, this is kind of a parallel history, I guess, is as more white children were leaving the system, there was a decision made that there needed to be a magnet program in, my, in the Montgomery schools, which is great. I think anyone who has, um, you know, gifts that, that they're great in math, they need those extra challenges, you know. Um, and it was fine because the programs remained in the traditional school setting. Um, and the kids still did sports together and they were still in the lunchroom together. And so it's still, had that integrate, it, it was integrated. 
Um, but then the, the magnet programs moved out of the traditional buildings because they wanted more. Um, at the same time, their enrollment was limited. Um, you know, the arts magnet school now is limited to 300 children. We're trying to change that. But you think 300 out of 29,000 can get into the arts? And so what about the 301st person? But there was not enough money to add to those programs or to bring that into the traditional schools. So one of the things is we needed money. And that was what we, the, the four of us that ran that are new, that's kind of what we have, our goal has been. Um, Matthew, I don't know what the process is in Tennessee as far as um, how you get a property tax passed, um, but it's pretty convoluted. So we started working like a year ago um, on this tax increase. So here's, here's the frustrating part. So our board, the school board, has to vote on a resolution to say, hey, we need more money. Here's what we need it for, here's what we need. And we vote, we pass a resolution, we all sign it. Because we have county schools, our resolution then goes to the county commission. Is that how y'all does? I'm gonna be honest, I have no clue. <laughs> I just, listen, this has been a big learning curve for me. Cause when I tell people that, they're like blown away. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is something, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so it goes to the county commission and they have to have a, if they have to advertise for two weeks to have a public forum for people to come and talk, you know, either for or against it and then they vote on it. Now their vote and our vote only has to be um, majority, okay? So the two, there are um, five county commissioners and two of those are white and the two whites voted against it, okay? But it still passed. So that resolution then goes to our local legislation. So it's the representatives and the senators that represent Montgomery County. And so they have to unanimously, like every one of them have to approve this before it goes to the whole legislative body to pass a bill to say, okay, we're gonna get it on the ballot for the people to vote. So what was happening that night at the board meeting on March the 10th is the two, there are two white legislators, one is a representative and one is a senator who are blocking it, who said, no, we're, we're not gonna be in favor of it. We're not gonna let it go to the full, the full um, legislation to pass and we're not gonna get it on the ballot. Um, I spent, because both of these, the Senator representative are in my district, my school board district. And so I spent a lot of time over six weeks because the legislation had just gone in in February. So I had spent a lot of time with them and um, they were like, no, we're not gonna do it. We're, you know, we're, we're not voting for it. And all I kept saying was, just let us get it on the ballot. If the people, um, if the people, wait one second, sorry. This is, this is what happens in, um, in life and it, my battery's running low. But anyway, um, so what happened is they kept saying no and we said, okay, well, we're gonna have to hire lobbyists to, to go down to the state house. So that night we were voting on a contract to hire these lobbyists at the tune of $12,000 a month from March the 1st until June 30th. And they were okay with that. So I spoke to the representative, he and I have been friends for our, our whole lives. We, you know, our parents knew each other growing up. And I just said, what can I do? I'm begging of you now, what, what can I do I'll do anything, but we just want to get it so the people can vote on it. He said, there's nothing you can do. So that night, right when we brought to the floor to vote on these lobbyists, it, I swore I wasn't going to say anything. And, and <laughs> all that, of a sudden- isn't that, isn't that how we all think, right? We're not going to say anything. I mean, <laughs> and then I was like, the, the, the spirit and the energy that overcame me, 
it was almost like I was listening to someone else as I was sitting there and I had no idea that it was going to resonate like that. But what it amounted to, Matthew, is, um, well, let me say this first. Five years ago this August, within Montgomery County, there is a, a little incorporated area called Pike Road. Five years ago, Pike Road got their own school system, okay? And it is majority white. I, I will just say this. Their millage is 28, 28 mills. It had no problem going through the any county commission, through the legislation, nothing. Had no problem at all. And so what it amounts to, and, and you, you know, you'd have to be blind not to see this, Montgomery, on the other hand, besides Pike Road, Montgomery is 36% white. So if this goes to the polls, the, the majority is gonna vote for better education for their kids. And those are the black and brown parents. But they're not gonna get an opportunity to vote for that for their children because of these two representatives, this representative and senator. And it has, it, I can't even tell you so now we're having to pay extra out of the school that we don't have to try and get this passed. Um, if it still goes through, if they agree on it and it goes to the full legislative body, um, we have two years to get it on the ballot. We know it's not going to be this year, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we weren't any closer to them voting for it before the virus, but now, you know, the legislature is closed. Oh, yeah. So there, there's no way, but they can still work some stuff behind the scenes, you know how that, that goes. So um, it's, it's very frustrating to me, it really is. And, and their reasoning is, we think that the school needs to be more accountable for the money they have. There is no money, there, there is no money. And now, you know, we're seeing these kids don't have Wi-Fi, just what you were saying. Um, our school buses have a GPS in them and um, we are looking at parking the school buses during the day in the neighborhoods that need the Wi-Fi. Um, not all the kids have the, the tools either. And just like y'all that we're passing out packets at, at meals and, um, and that's, you know, what about those that can't, that, you know, that there is no transportation. So when you say, you know, it just... I'm trying to like stay calm and, but when, when, yeah, I have to. <laughs> when politicians say you need to do better with the money you have, like, what do they think money is being spent on? We don't like in, in, I'm sure like Tennessee, Alabama is probably not one of the top states of funding, right? We, we, no, no, <laughs> we don't get, I mean, I look at comparative of other states and I'm like, I can't even believe we can open a school building. You know, we're, we're literally, we're in the middle of budget right. season right now. And I'm very fortunate to be in a school district that the majority of the money goes to the school and we have what's called student-based budgeting. So I and my leadership team in my school get to make determinations on how we spend the funding we have based off of our needs. But there's still times it's like, do we, are we going to get an extra person or are we going right. to make sure we have enough programming for different i mean it is and yet we we throw money out of all exactly. people just the legislator saying we need to be more responsible it just well oh. and that too okay i gotta plug in one second okay there we go sorry about that oh no worries it's life Hey, sometimes it's life right now. I'll tell you. Sometimes you have to plug it in life too and recharge. So no worries, yeah. metaphorically oh, yeah. speaking. But you know what? You're exactly right. It's that the thing is, schools and teacher pay and all of that. That should be where most of our money goes right out the bat, and and it should be because we are losing seven hundred to a thousand children a year in the Montgomery schools our population, I mean, I'm really anxious to see how the census comes out because our population is also decreasing. Um, we have two of our five employees that work at Child Protect don't live in Montgomery County. And so, you know, we see this decrease. We see businesses not want to come in. We see our housing value, whether you have kids or not, housing value goes down. What is the common, common reason for that? Schools. That's what they all say, the public schools. And so, you know, at one time Montgomery had 
more private schools than any other city in this country. And that's, that's a huge problem. What is the demographic of your school district? Do you know what's the, the racial breakdown? What's the socioeconomic breakdown? Do you know those numbers? Well, it's it, like you, it's about 65% at or below poverty. Um, it's about 92% black. Um, maybe about one or two percent Hispanic because we do have a, an increasing Hispanic population um, and then the rest are white so it's it's um, it's majority like I said of black and brown and the schools the school buildings the facility themselves are just crumbling I mean I went to high school here um, I graduated in 1979 from a school that was built in 1929 and there, there's no changes. I mean, now there's, there's no chemistry lab because the ceiling has crumbled and so they can't use the chemistry lab. And everybody seems okay with that. You know, it's like, oh, well, y'all need to do better with the money. You know, you can only do so much. Um, and this millage, we weren't even asking, but nine more just to get us up to 19. We didn't even ask to be equal with the other school system in Montgomery County. So how many kids are in the other school district in Montgomery County? I know you were going to ask me that. Maybe 1,000, 2,000, maybe. Wow. Very low. And is it, is, it predominantly, uh, is it predominantly white? Is that school district, is that what you stated earlier? Yes. So literally it is segregated. Your, there's two school districts segregated by color is what you're saying, pretty much. If it's 92, 93% of students yeah, of color, yeah, and yeah. the majority of the, uh, I mean, that in itself is just so mind boggling, but I'm gonna be honest and tell you, it's it's very similar in, in, in Nashville. I mean, and we I think, have massive amount of private schools, and I don't know if, you, if you've watched, but now our governor is pushing vouchers, which is vouchers for private school. And it's, it's, a, it's an amount that is basically supplementing those choosing to send their kids to private school. It's not going to be our underprivileged kids getting access to private school because no, they don't have the supplemental money to make up the difference. And we already have that. And not all the private schools will take the vouchers. You know, that's an optional too. Really? But that's, you know, but yeah, because the private schools have an option. I mean, they don't have to take it. Um, but the problem with that is, it, it that is like, that's that's not that many kids that are going to we also have whether if you're in a failing school regardless of where you live you can transfer to another school and so why is that my question is this school doesn't need to be better than this one we're all in the same system what are, what is going on you know is, is it the curriculum is are we not addressing things you know we know here um at child protect that the the poverty the stresses that come with poverty abuse so which leads to behavior problems juvenile delinquency teenage pregnancies drugs you know all of these things because of the poverty now we can't do anything about the pro poverty per se in the schools but we went through a, a class with our because we're we're still under state intervention too let me throw that out there um that the state came in two years ago. And so we're still under state um, intervention. And because of that, the current board has to do regular trainings. And so one of the trainings, it, very interesting to me, I'm probably not gonna say it exactly right, but it showed that with a good teacher, regardless of where the child comes from, they are gonna rise to what their learning level is. If their teacher, is paying attention instead of sending Johnny in the hall because he keeps fighting or he keeps sleeping or whatever the problems are we well we need the resources one to have someone that is able to just triage that and then say you know what um, he was up all night because he heard gunshots or you know he was up all night because he was hungry or there was fighting in his house so not really looking at what the root of the problem is 
is not is not helping. And then, you know, because I'm not an educator either, let me just say that, but you know, after a certain time in school, when they start dropping behind, and that's usually third grade, isn't that right? Well, Around? technically it's probably really starts at birth, but yes, yeah, by the time it becomes identifiable where people start panicking, it is third grade, yes. Right, so we passed a law last year, and I am just, you know, because I haven't read it in a long time, but we passed a law last year that every child that in third grade that finished third grade that was not on third grade reading level is going to be kept back. And I don't, I don't think it goes into effect this school year. I think it's 2021, 20, uh, 21, 22. Yeah. But you know, you think about that because that is a huge measurement of kids because we were getting to eighth grade and most of the kids couldn't read on eighth grade level. Well, and it's, I, I would, be interested to know what research was 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 developed for that decision because the research is clear that after very early elementary that that can have a major adverse effect on the outcomes increase of suicide rates increase of addiction because you think about the acceptance piece too now I don't know what the solution would be because we know that as they progress it gets more difficult but again, I think what you said is powerful. We're not actually looking at the root of the problem. When we're talking about systemic issues yes. that are impacting the daily lives of our kids where, here's what I say, if, if, people, if people have never worked with marginalized communities or mm -hmm. underprivileged areas, they don't, it, they, by no fault of their own, I guess, I don't know, maybe I'm just being a little too gracious, that you don't have a clue on what the challenges are on a daily basis. And I can tell you, my school is, by the state's measurement, is about 70% free and reduced lunch. They changed how they evaluate it. It's really probably closer to 89, 90%. But I have some of the most hardworking families ever. And yet they're working jobs where they're making minimum wage. They right. don't have health care. They're our, our city has exploded economically, so the housing is out of control. It's and yet crazy. people are, yeah. And people are saying, well, pull yourself up by your bootstraps because you just got to work harder. But when you're fighting against a system, a system that is by design oppressive, that is yes. holding yes. people back because of a variety of reasons, it's not realistic for that to occur without some kind of buffer. And so I think it's interesting that when you advocated, that's what you're advocating for. Until we can have a, a true conversation about this child is exposed to this. And we know adverse childhood experiences data, and we know that was done on a predominantly white middle class demographic yeah. by Kaiser Permanente and the CDC. Like they didn't look at poverty, didn't look at racism, didn't look at any of these major factors. But yet we just want our kids to come to school and do better. And here's what I say. Yeah. yeah. And we and ask. They're normal and they're doing the best they can. But we can't compare the kid on this side of the county line who has every resource and goes to sleep at night with a full belly and a hug and. and Clean sheets. We, yeah. We, it's, and and this. This isn't even necessarily a race conversation that we're in right now. It's more of an equity when it comes to socioeconomics. But then you add the, the race layer and oh my goodness, it even gets more complicated. Well, and you know, you know the history of Montgomery. Sure. And yeah. so, you know, so we have that that has perpetuated. Now on the outside, you know, oh yeah, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. But like you said, those of us who are on the front lines and are down in, you know, right there on the front lines with these families recognize it. You know, I had somebody that told me, um, well, we were charter schools. Do, do y'all charter schools? We have a ton of charter schools. Okay. I, I want to ask you about that, but I, I'm going to say this. So we just got the legislative pa legislation passed. And so... Um, big push to have a charter school, not a startup, but the conversion. So, you know, pick, we pick two, or they did, who's going to do it? Um, two elementaries, the middle school, and then the high school. So it was going to start, or it's going to start, I think, next year. So we, it got time to vote on it. And 
so everybody in the city was like, this is our solution. The chamber, you know, they were pressuring us to vote on it. So it got that time to vote and the, the representative from agency that's going to oversee it got up. And so I just said, I've got three questions. I want to know how, how many public forums did you have so that parents could come and learn about it? Well, we hadn't done that yet. Okay. How many churches did you go to? And because, you know, everybody goes to church and that's a great, you know, the majority. How many churches did you go and present this to so that parents of these children, that it's going to affect how, how many? Zero. And how many pastors, my last question, how many pastors and how many business owners in those communities where these four schools are? Now, we're just talking like a little, you know, a little pocket here. How many of those did you meet with and explain to them what charter schools are? Well, our plan is to, this was on a Tuesday night, our plan is to start doing that Thursday. And I said, well, I'm not gonna support the vote. So it didn't even get a second on our school board. And let me tell you about the, I mean, crazy that, that went on. And I said, I would not appreciate someone just coming and saying, this is gonna be how your kid's gonna go to school without me understanding it. And it is a lot to understand. So um, about six, now we did vote on it six months later, they did go in the communities and they did what they should have done on the, the other end. And, and we're gonna have one. Um, like I said, it's gonna be the 21-22 school year. So I don't know, it'll be our first one. So, well, I, I think, I think the, uh, for the sake of being transparent, I, I'm, a, I'm an uh, option school. So any kid can come to my school. We don't get to turn people away. There's no lottery. It's you apply, if there's room, you come. And I think that that needs to be a level playing field for every school mm -hmm. um, because what I've learned and in, in it, it's, it's like anything, right? There's good and there's bad of everything. There's charter schools in Nashville that I respect that do amazing work and there's others that I don't. And that's any, that's any entity, right? right. There's people right. who operate. I think anytime you're tying public money to a private organization or private there's risk and i we've seen the risk um unfold here for example we had a charter system that the principal was being paid three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right because it's private there's no regulatory practices they can spend their money how they want um that's not all of them that was one of them and it was awful and it wasn't okay and it was ethically wrong and um it, it's just i think what's happening is in education, there's a privatization movement, right? To try to privatize education because they're so, there is a lot of money. Billions of dollars are at stake and we're not looking at kids when we're thinking about that. The big system is looking at the money. And just like yeah, you said, like your own, yeah, your legislator said, well, it's about the money. Really, it's not about the money. It's about the kids. And about the further the you get away from the school, the broader the vision becomes and the less narrowed down to a child that it gets to. And I think, you know, I always said, I wish I could see Undercover Boss where every legislator went into a school and taught for a week and didn't tell anybody they were a legislator. And I will tell you, it would change perspective in a very hot, quick yeah. minute. But you know what? Even if they walked around our school buildings now, even if they said, look, come show me, show me what you're talking about. But they haven't done that. Well, and blind so, ignorance is a choice. You can be blindly ignorant. I mean, yeah. and that's and you, what it is. And you make the choice to not see that these are, the majority of these students want to learn. They want to have every opportunity. Um, one of the things is the arts in the schools you know, the, the um, technical stuff, the mechanical stuff, because we want, if, if Johnny over here is a great reader, but maybe not so great in math or science, you know, but a great reader, you know, what is it that we can encourage him to do? What can we recognize in him? Because we all, we all were created with a purpose and we all have something in us that's a drive if we're given those opportunities. And the only place we're gonna get that in the beginning is our schools. 
I mean, that's where it's got to be. And so we offer, I'm just asking, like you said, equitable learning opportunities. That's it. That, that is, that's putting it out there. It's not saying that these 300 children over here in the magnet program, they get to study dance and they get to study the arts and they get to do the math stuff and, you know, all of those different things with this, not even a percentage of what we're doing, you know, the rest of the kids. We need, everybody needs that. We also need counselors in schools. You know, our society is different. Um, you know, mostly what we're talking about now are urban schools, and this is like it is all over the country. They have been neglected. Um, and so that's where we've got to get back to. But there's got to be a massive movement. I mean, we can talk all day, but we've got to do something about it. Um, one of the things that I really want to see come out of all of this is to be able to, because we can't even provide books for all our kids. And so I would love to have every child in our system with a notebook, a, a computer notebook, so that we know this, because of the virus and everything, I feel like that we're going to start moving more towards technology. And so every child needs that. They need that in their possession every single day at school to do their lessons. And so I'm really, um, we've got, you know, the specs on what we need and how much it would cost to um, fund it. And that is, that is going to be my next thing. I'm fixing to get on it and, and raise the money because um, we're not obviously going to get any type of property tax passed in this next year. Well, and I will tell you, there is a movement and, and you're on part of it that there's a national movement right now called trauma sensitive, trauma informed, trauma. But what we're learning is we're away from, we're moving away from the big T trauma, although those are really important. And we're starting to talk about systematic problems. Mm -hmm. And, and I think what the, the COVID-19 has done is it has truly put a spotlight and exposed true inequities within our systems because it's just, I mean, I'm a resourced person. My wife works for the state of Tennessee as an engineer. I'm a principal of an elementary school. Um, and we started getting emails from our teachers that they needed to do online learning. I don't have those. We don't have any, I have one computer in my home and like I ordered computers that can't be possible. What it also has learned is the power of connection, is that everybody right now is seeking connection. And we know the brain science. We know that the buffer of adversity, of trauma, of little t trauma and big t trauma comes down in connections. And I think what I heard you say was, that's the power of a school, is that we can have positive daily interactions with kids that can buffer adversity. However, yeah the problem is bigger than that, right? So now we're saying, and, and what you said, if schools changed, yeah, I would think schools changed. I graduated in 1995. There's people who graduated a lot earlier than I did, just like you. We're not even in the same, like the, the, the expectations are completely different on kids. They're being exposed to media every day, instantly, where I had this conversation with my mom, my dad was wounded in Vietnam and she got a telegram that took a couple days. Like right now, Something can happen, and I'll know within sometimes a minute or less yeah, that this happened. Less. And, and we can't say, well, when I was in school, it was like this. Or when I was no, in school, I no. was paddled, and it worked. No, it's a completely – we know better. We have to do better. And I think that's what you're advocating for. We know this. So why we not do something mm -hmm. We know the problem. So now what are we going to do about it? You know, um, we're going to – continue to lobby for more money, and we're going to call it out. Um, you know, we cannot be silent about this because throughout the country, it is the, the, the majority of students that are being affected are black and brown. I mean, we, we've got to say that. Now, I'm not saying that there are no Caucasians, uh, you know, throughout that are not. I'm not saying that. But it really did start in the 60s. And we are still, you know, we live in Montgomery, and I don't know if you've had the opportunity to come down to see Brian Stevenson's um, lynching memorial and Equal Justice Museum. You've, if you've heard about it, though, right? I have, but I have not been able to be there to see it. I would love to one day, hopefully. Yes, it's closed right now, unfortunately. But um, so it, when it opened, um, I volunteered 
to help do some tours and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, of course I knew about it, you know, you know about the lynchings and you read about it, but never before did it resonate with me and really give me like an, a more of an understanding, you know, I would tell you the story. Um, I was in elementary school, my brother and I, and we had, my father was an alcoholic, like I told you, and he never worked and my mother worked. Um, and we were in elementary school and we had a housekeeper, Melissa. So every Friday, my mother got paid $80 and she would cash her check before she came home on that Friday. And she gave Melissa $40 and she kept $40. And so I remember asking her, you know, why, why do you give Melissa, you know, your money or, you know, half your money or whatever. And she said, because she can only do this, you know, this is what she can do, but I can go out and make money for both of us. And so that was my upbringing. We took Melissa home one day and she lived behind where Martin Luther King walked from the city, uh, Selma to Montgomery, um, behind St. Jude's, which is a big landmark, you know, for the civil rights, but Melissa lived behind there. And we took her home one afternoon, me, me and my brother and my mother, and um, as we drove up, Melissa's daughter was out in the street, hysterical crying over her little boy who had been hit by a car. And he was maybe six or seven, about my brother and mine's age. So my mother gets out and she says, you know, where's the ambulance? And they said they, they weren't coming, that they had other stuff. My mother picks this little black boy up, puts him in the back of the station wagon, and we go to the hospital. She takes him in and she says, where's the doctor? And they said, well, he's not going to be a priority because there are whites ahead. I heard this as a child. And my mother said, then get out of my way and show me where's a bed so that I can take care of him. And at that moment, the doctor scurried around and he survived and everything was okay. But the whole point of that story is, is that that, that affects a child when they see these things. And that is how I was brought up. And so even in elementary school and junior high school and high school, you know, we were not, we didn't see this big exodus yet. That was, that was not happening. And, you know, there were, there really were no problems. I mean, you know, back in the seventies, there, it just, it, I don't know, it, it, it was just different, more different than it is now, which is interesting that we went from total segregation to integration that, that worked. I mean, for the majority of people kept going, I don't know what happened in that, in that, you know, 80s and 90s. I don't know what happened with how it became um, more segregated than before, or at least on its way to being more segregated. Well, and I think too, if we have to be honest with ourselves and say, we're not far away from that civil rights movement. We're not far away from slavery. I mean, our country is so no. young. And I, you know, I, I was able to, to go to England and speak and travel around and seeing sites. And I'm the whole time I was thinking, oh my goodness, here it's like, oh, this is a hundred year old house and how old this house is. And there it's like, this house is 700 years old. And, and so I think we, we have, I think that we as a society are naive to think that those type of systematic, oppressive, unbelievably historical uh, tainting of our culture has no effect that lasts that long. And we know that through intergenerational transmission, and we also know through the epigenetic studies that are coming out, these, these historical pieces of our culture have had lasting effects. And again, yes. if we don't want to change it, then we're just in blissful ignorance of going, oh, this really doesn't have an impact and people just aren't working hard. And we okay. know that cannot be the case. And again, going back to your advocacy is sometimes we have to be uncomfortable and sometimes we have to make others uncomfortable for the sake of saying what is right. And I think right. that's what you've stood in that space as your mom. And, and what your mom did in front of you you have done in the public eye 
in oh, front of God. millions and millions and millions of people that have watched your video to watch the passion, to watch the sincerity, and to watch the advocacy for kids just like the little boy that your mom picked up. You are picking up thousands and to be honest, millions of kids around our country and you are lifting them up saying, we have to do something different. Where is the support? Where is the advocacy? And I hope you see that in yourself, which is why I had to reach out to you because I felt that inspiration. Thank you. Um, when I was growing up, I, I didn't get any brains or beauty, but I did get a really, really loud mouth. And um, I was always called out on it. I mean, my mother or the teacher would say, oh, I can hear Jana a mile away. But I always knew that God doesn't give you tools that he doesn't have a purpose for. And when I started working at Child Protect, that, I mean, everything that led up to that, obviously, but, but working here, I realized that there, there, there are so many children out there that are living in situations that are stressful, that are, you know, overwhelming and where there is abuse. And then they go to school and they carry that baggage, you know, but for me, um, having the mouth for the children, I have no regrets. Uh, you know, the biggest thing was going home to my husband. Uh, my husband is a family court judge here in Montgomery County. And so, you know, we see a lot of the same cases. We never talk about anything work related, but he and I both, we understand. I mean, we know what's going on in Montgomery, but I went home and I just said, listen, you know, we may get a cross burn in our front yard in the morning. I just want you to kind of be aware of that. And um, and because his approval or his support means a lot to me and he knows I'm way out there. He's a little bit more um, introverted than me, um, but he's getting more extroverted the longer we stay home together. So <laughs> I'm forcing him to talk to me, yeah. but we, um, but, you know, I went home and I just said, I, you know, I, I did speak tonight at the board meeting and you know, I want you to know what I said. I, it's probably not going to be on TV, but the board meetings are recorded for the MPS Montgomery Public Schools channel or whatever. And I said, I just want you to know. And um, he watched it, tears in his eyes. And he said, I'm so proud of you. And I said, that's all I needed to hear. Well, within about an hour, the um, lady that covers the, the uh, newspaper here in Montgomery had already put it online and I started getting calls and texts like 10 o'clock that night. I was like, what, what is happening right now? You know, what is this? And um, just to think that those few words could resonate around the world and that people are really listening and people want to do something. And it's like, I don't, I don't really know what to do next. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, I know that we've got to do better by our kids and, um, whatever that next step is, I, you know, I, for you, Matthew, to, to ask me to be on your show and just to continue talk about it. Um, and when all of this is over, we've got to be better. I believe we're going to be better. I believe we're going to be kinder. And I believe we're going to start talking about hard things because when, you know, our state as y'all's was too, one of the last to you know put some restrictions in place about this virus well look at look at our populations we are one of the poor states that are uninsured people that are not working that are at a higher risk you know there's a lot of diabetes and obesity and those types of things in in our southern states we all know that so it's almost like okay you know what else can we do to become at the bottom why can't we be at least the first in something um, but I think that after all this is over, I really believe in my heart of hearts that we're going to see a major movement for our schools. I, I really believe that people are going to realize that, hey, you know, we, we didn't have enough nurses. Maybe we need to, you know, better educate our kids so we'll have more nurses and doctors. Well, and I think, I think you're right. And I hope I'm, I'm uh, as I said, my exceptional ed teacher gave me this phrase. I'm insanely optimistic. Um, I but I that. also, um, I also think you're right. And it's interesting that you said that about when you were a kid, cause I always got in trouble for talking and 
Um, now I get paid to talk, which I think is uh, the ultimate interest. I mean, it's interesting. It's like, I was told my whole life, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Now I'm like, will you come and speak? Will you come and speak? We Yes, I, Hi. I was told to be quiet for so long. And now people are saying, will you come and speak? And the answer is always going to be yes. But at the end of the day, we have to continue to speak up. And we have to teach our own children. And we have to yes. teach our school. My school is a leader in me school, which we teach the seven habits of highly effective people to our kids. And habit eight, which is an unknown habit, is find your voice. And to me, mm -hmm. I can't just advocate for my kids. And I don't mean the kids in my home. I, I include them as well, but I mean all kids. All when kids, kids right. walk out of my school, my ultimate dream is that they're not only have an education, but they have the confidence to be able to use their voice to advocate for themselves. Because what we know has happened over time is people's voices have been squashed. And mm -hmm. that's what I think is so powerful about you is even in a school board, you know, there's that line that you have to tote and, yeah. and you have to be cautious and you blew that line up, caution to the wind and you jumped in for what was right. And I think as as educators, as advocates, as um, human beings, we have to have this conversation. Um, so the last thing I ask every guest is the same, and it's, what do you want educators to know? What do you want them to hear from you if they listen? And, and you can just tell every educator that listens one thing or two, what would it be? First, I'd like to say thank you. Um, thank you for choosing that profession because it, it really is a calling and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for my teachers. I talked to my English teacher from 12th grade last week. Um, she's in her nineties and she said, I always remember you cause you always talk. And you know, so I'm, I'm grateful for those teachers who recognized in me things that were not so great, but they encouraged me. And so I want to tell them thank you. And I also want to tell them that you know, change is a coming. Right now, change is a coming. Um, I believe that teachers are going to be recognized as one of the best and, and paid for what they are worth in this country. And I hope so. But thank you more than anything. Well, and I, I appreciate that. And I hope it's, I hope that comes to fruition because our educators deserve more. They do more, yes. they deserve more. So thank you so much uh, for talking to me. I really do appreciate Absolutely, it. Absolutely, Matthew. You were as inspiring as I thought you would be, and, and I'm leaving a better human having, having this conversation. So to all the listeners, um, please follow Jana if she has social media. Jana, do you have social media people can follow? I do. I'm on Facebook, and it's Jana Morgan Bailey, and I'm on Twitter. Um, it's at Jana Bailey on Twitter. I'm a little new to that, so... Um, you know, I, I, I'm learning. I've got a lot of um, really smart people that work with me. That's what, another thing that my mother always said, hire people that are smarter than you. It makes you look really good. So I've done a great job at that. So um, they are very helpful with my IT stuff. So yes, follow me and, you know, let's all speak loud together. So powerful. And, and just a reminder that a good opportunity to join the Disruptors Unite movement is the Trauma-Informed Educators um, Conference in July in Nashville. Um, as of right now, it is still on. We're going to wait till late May to make a, a final decision whether we're going to cancel. Um, but right now it's still on and that's July 20 and 21st of 2020 in Nashville. Oh. Um, it's put on by an amazing national team. We've got speakers from all over the world coming. Um, so if you haven't wow. got that registration, I think right now there's only eight left. So if you're a listener, you'll want to jump in on that pretty quickly. Um, and with the, with the COVID-19, uh, all registrations pretty much slowed down. We still get a couple here and there, um, but we do know that will sell out. So keep listening. Thank you for listening to the Trauma-Informed Educators Network podcast. Um, and if you know of a guest or you want to be a guest, please reach out and let me know. So thank you so much. Um, be safe, be well, and make sure you keep your distance.